welcome back to another episode of Debatable with your hosts, Nina and Kyle. I'm Nina. I'm Kyle. And today, we are joined by none other than Miguel Ventura, or Venti as we like to call them, who was the national champion of the Philippines from 2016, as well as the former coach of one of the most successful high school debate organizations, Ateneo High School Debate Team. They were also our motion contributor for the Philosophy Motion set back in Debatable Open, which we had last January of 2021. But professionally, they are not actually philosophers. Contrary to popular belief, they are not a philosopher. Professionally, they are an economist who graduated magna cum laude from the UP School of Economics, which I also come from, and working now at the Philippine Competition Commission. So, hi Venti! We're very happy to have you here with us again. Could you tell us a little bit about what the commission is, and what does it do, and what do you do for them? Okay, so, hi! I work as an economist under the Philippine Competition Commission, or the PCC. It is the antitrust agency of the Philippines. It's a relatively new agency. Uh, Just this January, I believe, we celebrated our five years of uh, being operational as an agency. So what an antitrust agency does is that it's the primary regulator of market competition and free competition in an economy. Uh, What that means is that we generally believe that free and open market competition is the best way to produce and allocate goods so that they're of higher quality and lower prices for consumers or citizens. And so what our work entails as the PCC is that we monitor uh, businesses and we review policies under the government to ensure that businesses can freely compete so that consumers can benefit from the benefits of a good economy. So I guess the first question I have is, how does competition increase the quality of goods or decrease prices? Debaters take this for granted all the time, saying competition does these two things, but the mechanization isn't always there. How does competition actually do that? I won't deal too much with the economics behind it right now. I guess where we can start is we can maybe analogize this to how debate competitions work, right? So I'm sure anyone and everyone watching this is trying to become a better debater. And I imagine there's a lot more people now, you know, give or take, uh, because of the conditions of the pandemic. Uh, there's a lot more people now that are able to debate because on online debating. And I'm sure it's a, it's a very tough um, situation now. Uh, people are getting better because there's more resources available, there's more tournaments available, right? So you feel that uh, people are getting better precisely because of these competitive conditions. There are many more tournaments to compete in. There are many more people that uh, you have to compete with or against. So it's generally, it is the competitive condition that drives us to become better speakers, uh, to develop more advanced techniques in debating, and overall lead to a more robust competitive circuit. So imagine that, but with a free market economy. If you have more businesses competing to provide what consumers want, and let's be realistic, consumers want a lot of things, it's hard to predict all of them. Then what a free market economy envisions is that the freer the competition and the more people that are able to compete, then there are more opportunities for businesses to create products at lower costs because you know you want to be the most efficient at making a certain product and you want consumers to buy your product. So oftentimes you will have to make it as cheap as possible for those consumers. So that's generally the idea behind why a free market or a competitive market will generally create goods that are better for consumers. Uh, If businesses stand to profit from um, being the ones that consumers buy from the most, and if consumers stand to benefit, on the other hand, from a better quality of goods, cheaper and more affordable goods, then that is a mutual relationship between businesses and consumers that should drive a cycle of economic activity that uh, develops the economy as a whole. So if I'm correct, the more you have to compete, the better you have to be in order to survive in the market. But my question now is, why do you need the PCC or indeed any antitrust agency at all, um, considering that according to the classical view of economics, you or the government don't need to intervene in these kinds of ways because the market is most of the time self-correcting. If a firm, for example, is not doing well or it's a monopolist, for example, the classical view would say that you don't need the PCC you don't need an antitrust agency because everyone else has an incentive to enter the market as soon as possible and compete on its own accord. So, given that there will always be these incentives to enter the market and compete anyway, why is the PCC necessary in order to get that free and competitive market that you wanted to talk about? All right. So, generally speaking, and I guess this applies with most regulation, um, there are some fundamental simplifications that the classical view holds. And those simplifications include a number of things. 
things. Uh, the fact that it's generally difficult to find capital, the fact that some industries are more technically specific than others, or the fact that once you reach a certain size as a business, then you are able to have enjoy certain advantages that are a bit more durable than the classical than classical schools of economics would give you for. Like as a bigger business, you probably have a larger network of suppliers that you can get a better deal with. If you are a large business, you probably hire a good number of people that want to contribute to that business and make sure that the business will continue profiting. So unlike a classical model where there's, uh, you know, people can just freely go in and out of work, uh, you know, some people want to build the brand of the company. And obviously, there's a lot of experience that goes into big business. So all of these factors combined uh, can often lead to very strong companies, which are not necessarily bad. You do want a strong company, but it does give a lot of incentive for these incumbents or dominant firms, as you might call them in our parlance, uh, to make sure that the market economy will not improve without their say-so. So the point of a regulator at that time, when you know a big company tries to flex its muscle, uh, maybe by um, unfairly making deals with suppliers or unfairly raising prices against consumers, and that's usually when a regulator will step in because um, smaller businesses or even similar-sized businesses that don't have those unique advantages might not be enough to discipline those uh, incumbents or dominant firms to do the quote unquote right quote unquote right thing uh, in the economy. So that's where the PCC and most regulators will step in. They have the power of the state to recommend uh, structural changes to that business. They have the power to implement uh, policies that make sure that if a business becomes too problematically too large, then there are ways to address concerns that consumers and fellow competitors will have. So the free market generally isn't enough in the real world because in the real world, there will be advantages of becoming of being bigger and better that aren't taken away so easily. At that time, it's the, the, it's the goal of the state to step in and cut down uh, big and bad firms to size, so to speak. What makes it so bad if a big dominant corporation or firm quote-unquote flexes its muscles, so to speak? Why is that something that we consumers have to care about? Well, we start with the classic example of the monopoly, being literally one seller. Um, generally, if you know that you're the only seller in the market and you know that the goods that you're selling are very difficult to make, and you know that most suppliers of the thing of the inputs you need for that good would rather deal with you, a familiar face, as compared to a smaller startup who's relatively unknown. Then you know that it's there's really no pressure for you to continue improving the product for the people you're going to sell them to. Because who are they again? Who are they going to turn to? A relative unknown whose quality is untested, or someone like you who admittedly his quality is going down, but it's the brand that everyone knows anyway is already buying. So that's where that, that's what we mean by flexing their muscles. Um, for consumers, you will most likely see that in increased prices. This could be literal price increases, meaning uh, from, say, 20 pesos per unit, it suddenly becomes 35 pesos or 40 pesos. But it could also mean, we, by, we, by price increase, we could also mean uh, degradations in qualities or services that you can offer to the consumer. Um, so, for example, maybe the price of the thing that you're buying from the monopolist might still be the same in cash. It might still be 20 pesos in our example. But maybe the quality of the material isn't as good anymore. Maybe it doesn't have the same um, characteristics that you expected from this brand. Maybe it's just harder for you to get because the monopolist can also cut off the supply. So that's what we mean by uh, price factors, so to speak. It, it's it's a shorthand for the literal price or the qualities associated and reflected in the price. Um, so that's on the consumer side. And that's generally the most apparent. And that's why most citizens are concerned with monopoly. We hope citizens are most concerned with monopolies because if you know the person who's trying to sell you stuff is not afraid of you not um, taking your business elsewhere then they have all the reason to you know make your lives a little bit more difficult um, but there are also harms like we've mentioned to on the business side again if you're the monopolist and you know suppliers of your inputs can't go anywhere else then you can also um, do other things like maybe you can lowball them for prices uh, you can set up very unfair contract terms that say you have to sell me uh, X number of volume at this mark at this increasingly lowered price or we will simply not buy from you anymore and we will buy from other competitors. So all these things to make sure that your competitive position, your dominant position um, is protected. Not because you have a better product, not because you have a better business mechanism, but because literally no one else is there 
to discipline your actions and force you to make a better product. So that's why I think we should be concerned with dominant entities, uh, especially when they find that you know service and quality is no longer one of their top priorities. Okay, so they flex their muscles in order to maintain their dominance. My question now is how exactly do they do that flexing? What kind of acts are we talking about to maintain their dominance? Could you give us some examples or matter as to how they try to keep their market power? Right, so um, as I mentioned, on the consumer side, you could have things like, you know, uh, you're raising the prices, meaning you're making things literally more expensive, or you are degrading the quality of these goods and services so that, uh, you know, you're paying for the same thing, but in reality, you're not getting your money's worth. Um, you can check the Philippine Competition Act. Section 15 is all about, at least for the Philippines, Section 15 is all about abuse of dominant positions. And these are just the general provisions as to how a monopolist or a group of dominant firms might do them. One major part of this is barriers to entry. There might be general uh, economic barriers to entry, of course. Um, it's hard to set up a business because you need a lot of money, you need a lot of know-how, you need a lot of resources. But monopolists or dominant firms can increase those barriers to entry significantly. Maybe these could be through contracts with suppliers that say, hey, you're not allowed to uh, deal with um, this XYZ competitors or else we'll cut you out. Actually, it's more of a price-fixing thing or an agreement between uh, competitors, but we'll deal with that later. Uh, but ge the general idea is barriers to entry being set up by a dominant firm means that you are making it even more difficult for new companies to source the resources, the manpower, uh, and the markets in order to make competing products and to hopefully drive the price down because there's more good. You have other things such as imposing restrictions on sales or contracts that you have with suppliers or your retailers. So like what I mentioned, you could maybe say, I will only buy XYZ amounts of volume from you if you set it at this low of a price to a supplier of your goods. Uh, and if they don't fulfill that, then you as a dominant firm will enforce that contract and say, okay, we're just not going to buy from you anymore. We'll just buy from these other suppliers. So, you know, you're just ruining another co company's business. Similarly, uh, if you're going to sell these goods to a retailer, who will eventually sell them to the consumer and also have to make a profit from that. You could set similarly uh, onerous conditions saying, you have to buy from me this amount of volume. Like say if you're a grocery, you have to buy 80% uh, of all your stock uh, from my company. Uh, and I will give you a discount for that. But but if you're unable to give that, do that volume, then I will take away that discount or I can just say I will not sell to you and you will not be able to sell this wonderful product that consumers uh, expect from you anyway. So there are all these different things that monopolists can do to take to exert their muscle. The reason these things maintain their dominant position is because they know this particular product is currently not contested and people expect this product to be available anyway, even if the quality or the prices are becoming terrible for consumers or businesses along the supply chain. So when a competitor tries to come and disrupt that, then they try making all these deals or they try uh, imposing all these economic conditions that just make it harder for competitors to even uh, step foot into the market. You mentioned Section 15 of the Philippine Competition Act, but another thing that's interesting to me is actually Section 14, which says that agreements like price fixing or restraints of trade are quote-unquote per se prohibited. What does a per se prohibition mean? What does it entail? And why are these things per se prohibited? Prohibited. Okay, so I'm not a lawyer. You will you will definitely benefit more from this because um, I don't think we'll discuss this too much here. But over many years, there has come to be an, be an understanding in antitrust economics that things that look kind of anti-competitive at first might actually have some economic justifications depending on the industry. So all industries are different. So the necessary economic conditions to make the products and services of those industry might differ from one industry to another. Therefore, we can't just say certain contracts that are harmful in one industry might also be harmful in another industry. So that's where uh, things such as the rule of reason uh, or generally you want to weigh the the pros and cons of economic conditions come in. But we won't deal with that per se, uh, too much. We'll focus on what you just asked, which is per se. The general idea is that price fixing is per se illegal because there is no economic justification for that. And the actual case for that, at least in U.S. Uh, jurisprudence, is for the case U.S. versus Sakoni Oil Vacuum. That's S-O-C-O-N-Y, Sakoni Vacuum. Generally, that is the case that established that price fixing is per se illegal. There is no economic justification for it. There is no reason for you to do price fixing because higher prices to consumers are generally always bad. You know, unless, of course, these prices are meant to reflect actual costs, um, but these are obviously not the case. So the problem in uh, US versus Sakoni vacuum was that at the time, um, 
these oil companies in the US were trying to were trying to make an agreement to raise the prices of oil barrels because at the time I believe there's an oversupply of oil in the United States so obviously prices were going down oil is cheaper which is going to cut into the profit margins of these uh, companies so when prosecuted for this the oil company said hey we need to raise these prices because competition is ruining us we're losing so much money because prices are low and we need to maintain our profit. But what the U.S. Supreme Court decided is that, no, you cannot, and I quote, permit the age-old cry of ruinous competition and competitive evils to be a defense to price-fixing conspiracies. It has no more allowed genuine or fancy competitive abuses as a legal justification for such schemes than it has the good intentions of the members of those combinations. So it means, so generally, very simply, it means it doesn't matter if you're going to lose money um, because because of competition and therefore you you need to fix prices that's the whole point of competition that's the whole point of the market if you are unable to provide consumers with these goods at lower prices just because you're unprofitable then you you just lost the competition you just lost the market and the gain should go to winners not losers in this in this instance so that's why price fixing is a per se harm or per se violation of antitrust laws all across the world it doesn't matter if someone wins or loses it, it doesn't matter if you want to fix prices and raise the costs because you're losing money. That's the whole point of the competition. There are winners and losers and competitor and consumers and citizens of a, of a country should be able to uh, uh, profit from the fruit of these winners and not pay the costs of these losers. We don't want to pay for less efficient companies. We don't want to pay for worse goods. We want to pay for the best goods at the most affordable prices. So I, I hope that answers the question. I, I know of another example of price fixing in oil that is just straight up allowed which is the price fixing that's done by petroleum exporting countries in the Middle East they do it through and I'm sure you know this Venti the OPEC um, which is the organization of petroleum exporting countries and they fix prices per barrel of petroleum that they produce and export but the international community hasn't said anything like to the effect of banning this in fact while a lot of people are inconvenienced by this price fixing it's recognized as like an endemic reality so my question is why is price fixing okay if OPEC does it but if it's in the United States like the case that you mentioned or in the Philippines like if Shell did price fixing with Petron or something else like that it's not allowed why is OPEC sort of like a different or why does OPEC um play by a different set of rules so I imagine that difference has something to do with the fact that OPEC members are states so um I'm not particularly familiar with how states can agree to these kinds of economic consideration there is a consideration that um they do want to manage supply of oil across the world so that prices are generally reasonable at least for their own coffers but what we're focused on are private entities or private companies within the boundary within uh, the national level meaning you know these are just private citizens anyway and on that level you don't want to i would say you don't want any particular private citizen or entity to unnecessarily enrich themselves because of unfair competitive acts you want these you want um, entities within your economy to compete to the best of their ability because um, and this is a basic tenet of economics there are very scarce resources and you want to make the best use of those so you entrust private entities I imagine with all with all these business rights with all the freedoms to do business or whatever but I guess in a way you expect a return on this your economy you want your citizens to enjoy better products you want your citizens to enjoy cheaper products and so price fixing agreements between these companies um, is a sort of violation on that part like they are colluding to use these scarce resources resources primarily for themselves um, enriching themselves at the cost of um, you know not providing these better products or services for consumers and that's generally a bad thing right you don't want your consumers to have expensive goods you don't want your consumers to have terrible goods and price fixing as a defense for saying oh we need money it's just not going to fly because consumers need money too and they're going to lose their money if they're unable to get goods at reasonable prices so I, I don't know that's maybe that's my view on it personally I want to ask now because you said there are agreements that strengthen a firm's monopoly or market position but are not deemed as anti-competitive because they have economic justification, so to speak. Could you tell us more about that? Does that mean that there are some instances where an oligopoly or even a monopoly could be justified from a competition point of view? Okay, so there are some uh, industries that are best served by what we would call a natural monopoly. It just generally means that the a 
average cost, the lowest uh, average costs to efficiently serve that industry are best achieved when you only have one firm or company trying to fulfill all those costs rather than all these different companies trying to spend and do and put out their services but increase the overall cost. So these are generally utilities, things like electricity and water. Why is that the case? Well, put it this way, um, for water, um, it is just generally more efficient for one or two sets of companies to plan out most of the infrastructure um, across your city, perhaps, so that only one set of pipes is needed to plan out the infrastructure. As opposed to, say, 10 different companies um, trying to make their own grids across all of Metro Manila. So that's 10 different pipes, sets of pipes all under your streets. Um, so that's obviously going to crowd out a lot of your infrastructure. And since all of those different companies have to recoup their costs, it's probably going to result in higher prices because laying pipes isn't expensive. That's a lot of digging. That's a lot of metal work. That's a lot of heavy machinery needed. So it's very likely that they're still going to have to raise prices against those consumers, especially for those very cap very resource and capital intensive goods. But if you can concentrate all those costs and planning into one company or two companies, like in this case, it's Maynilad and Manila Water for Metro Manila, then those average costs are going to go down and prices will go down for consumers as well. Um, similar thing for electricity, at least for the distribution leg, meaning those, you know, those really, really big towers that you see uh, along the super, along the major super highways of the Philippines, like NLEX, uh, SLEX, um, that connect between regions. Um, it's generally just more efficient to have one or two companies putting out those large towers as opposed to, say, several different companies making these major electrical grids all across the country, um, therefore increasing all the costs needed to put up electricity, costs that have to be paid anyway and will eventually be passed down to um, consumers. So that's generally an example of where a monopoly or oligopoly might make sense. Okay, since we're talking about natural monopolies, that reminds me of a classic debate about privatizing or nationalizing public utilities like water or electricity or even prisons. A lot of debaters, when they argue about or for privatization, they say that privatization increases competition and makes everything better. Now, given your characterization of natural monopolies, it seems like either way, there would be a monopoly that exists. Either the state is a monopoly or the firm is a monopoly. Either way, you're going to get subpar services. What would the debate then be? Right, so that's that's actually a great point and it's something I wish we learned like when we were younger. I think uh, the problem with a lot of privatization slash nationalization debate or the way that people approach them here rather is that we jump a bit too quickly into the whole aspect of you know expected government service versus private service without taking a step to first analyze wait a minute what is this industry we're actually talking about right it's um, again, like industries are very different. The electricity and power industry is very different from, I don't know, the prison industry because I mean, you know, that, that's a common motion. And the prison industry is very different from, say, uh, the water industry. Um, so uh, before jumping into that, you want, I think, debaters first and foremost need to understand what are the what is this industry about? What are the major business considerations here? So like what are the costs involved in setting up a company or the infrastructure related? How should we expect the entities here to garner profit? Meaning, like, uh, like on the most neutral condition, being able to get revenues from the users or buyers of their products and making those revenues um, be more than their cost, right? So, like, like, like by that definition, a lot of government agencies technically have to profit, or at least make sure that with the revenue generating age, ge have revenue generating activities so that you know they can defray a few of those costs. Uh, an, an infamous example here um, would be you know getting licenses or certificates from your different regulatory agencies agencies or registration agencies like you know that some of these certificates aren't going to expire for five to ten years but why are agencies always asking you to pay for that certificate and because it's a revenue generating thing they need money but anyway so the point is you want to lay out your goalposts and say what do we want here do we want lower prices for the consumer do you want to make sure the infrastructure of this business or industry is good how are we measuring that so back to your point on making it a government monopoly or a business monopoly I think even without that consideration, I think what most people have to characterize is, you know, what are their main incentives to provide service? So obviously a government ha government agency has the mandate to, you know, literally provide that service or else, you know, budget their budget is going to get cut by angry congressmen that can use, you know, the, the, the political will generated by their constituents to grandstand the Congress, say this agency is not performing, and then, you know, just cut them or, you know, promise to protect them, but now they have the favor of 
involved, they have the favor of the, the congressman to protect. On the other hand, you have a private business that literally will have to profit or else um, they're not going to be able to pay for these fixed costs or variable costs. Um, they want to provide service because that's literally how they will profit. Um, and that will apply even for a natural monopoly. Like Manila Water and Manila, for example, have the incentive to profit and not just um, not just rest their laurels on government subsidies, for example, because profiting is more assured that it, it, government um, profits are another revenue stream and companies want as much revenue as possible. A uh, good service is a way for customers to better pay on those revenues. So that's a way to guarantee revenue. So those comparisons really, I think, are more are, are, are things that have to be brought up more when talking about privatization and nationalization. So yeah, it seems that depending on the circumstance, there are industries where having an oligopoly or monopoly is not anti-competitive. What's an example of an anti-competitive agreement that is still allowed because of an quote-unquote economic justification? Um, for some acts that might be anti-competitive but might also have an economic justification, so I'll just give one. Um, there is a practice called resale price maintenance. Generally, it is an agreement between a seller of a good or a seller and maker of a good to all these different retail um, outlets, like say a shopping mall or a or an outlet store. And the agreement is basically, oh, you have to maintain this amount of pri this price for the goods that we sell at our store. Otherwise, if you try to sell it at a lower or discount price, then we are going to not sell to you anymore. You won't be able to sell our product. You will not be able to profit from it. So at first glance, you think, well, this is anti-competitive because you're making sure that the price stays up uh, at a certain level. But isn't the point of market competition uh, to make sure these goods become more become cheaper? And on a, on a first glance, you think, yeah, that's, that's correct. It's anti-competitive. But there are other considerations, um, economic considerations to the business and to the supply chain that might make one reconsider whether or not this price, this price agreement between a seller and a distributor uh, might be bad. So for example, you have two retail one of them is a retailer that has a lot of customer service. So they're not literally just stocking the shelves um, with goods. They also have customer service representatives that will help you look for the goods that you want. They will have warranty um, packages for your goods. They will have technicians that are available if you want to fix your goods. So all these obviously have a cost, right? They, they can't just sell you maintenance and all these value-added benefits for free. And so obviously they have to recoup that and they will usually bake that into the price of their goods. So I imagine that if you're a retailer, the price that you're selling to the consumer is based on the cost it took for you to purchase it from the maker of the good, uh, your value added services so that your consumer you know, gets all these different benefits from shopping from you. And of course, you know, price of uh, the cost to have a nice profit margin. Compare that with a store that is literally just like a bargain dump. They're just um, like, like a factory outlet or whatever and they're just going to dump all these goods. Obviously those, go those are going to be cheaper because they don't have any value added benefits. Now, where am I going? Um, let's say, what if I'm just going to the first store to check out what goods are I want and I say okay I say I'm looking for a bag I know from going to this one store with all these value added benefits that ah I want this bag but I don't care about those value added benefits I just want the bag so because I saw it first in company in the first company I can just go to the bargain bin store that doesn't have these value added benefits and buy from them cheaper so that's generally good for the consumer but that's also kind of bad for the first company that's trying to make all these value added benefits available and it's also kind of bad for the maker of those goods who are selling to such companies because because that might erode the brand. Like if you were Gucci, I, I'm not entirely sure you would benefit from selling from your local, from distributing your goods through the local ukai ukai, right? So um, resale price man maintenance as a result is not a per se violation. So it is price fixing, but it can, it is a, 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 specifically, it is an agreement between a company on one part of the supply chain and another company on the, on the other part of the supply chain. So it's a vertical price fixing. It's a bit more complex than your usual, oh, we're going to set the, we, it's it's a bit more complex than your usual conspiracy between competitors who are all on, on the same part of the supply chain. And the reason it becomes, it goes outside of the per se is because there are economic justifications that will benefit the entire supply chain and potentially the consumer if you let this slide in certain instances. So in the instance of say like bags or goods or hardware, maybe resale price maintenance is a good thing because um, if you can, as a seller, as a maker of these goods,
goods. If you can maintain your goods at being sold at a particular price point, then maybe it protects the brand equity of your product. So I like an extreme example would be obviously Gucci wants to make sure its goods are sold at a particularly high price because it's a luxury brand anyway. Like the people who want to buy it are probably rich. Um, it would probably harm Gucci if they could put it, they could sell it to a retailer, but that retailer is a bargain bin or ukay ukay that will sell it at a discount. So you're getting a bag at a lower price, but that's also going to worsen the performance of Gucci. Um, it's also resale price maintenance is also good for the retailer, especially for retailers that are putting in the extra effort to provide more services and more value to consumers, like customer service, warranties, technicians, um, referral systems. Aren't all those good things outside of price? And like we mentioned earlier, price isn't just the literal um, uh, cash or money cost that you slap onto a product. It could also be all things like quality and service that are baked into the product. So resale price maintenance is an assurance uh, from from us, uh, from the seller to the retailer, that there will not be competing retailers or outlet stores that will try to undercut you just because they're not willing to provide all these different uh, value-added services to the consumer. And as an end result, maybe the consumer even benefits, even if it is a higher cost, because maybe that cost, that price is justified, again, because of all these value-added services. Like, sure, I can probably get the bag that I want from a bargain bin store, but because I continue to go to that bargain bin store, I might lose out on, I might lose out in the future on stores that are able to provide all these value-added services like customer aid, uh, warranties, and technical help to maintain my goods. So isn't that in the future that like, fine, you're getting high lower prices now, but you might also get lower quality goods and therefore higher prices in the future. Isn't that something worth considering? So that's one major example of where some seemingly anti-competitive um, or very potentially abusive actions might actually be a bit more beneficial than you give them credit for. So there's a broad category of these things. Um, that's why outside of price picking, there are a lot of things, um, cases that will fall under rule of reason um, or generally you weigh the pros and cons. I don't want to get too deep technical about it. In fact, Section 15 of the Philippine Competition uh, Commission Act is precisely not per se because uh, things like maybe barriers to entry on, on first hand, uh, it, it looks kind of bad because obviously it's harder for competitors means there's less people to threaten incumbents at lower prices. But on the other hand, maybe it is just generally hard to enter an industry. Maybe you do need a company that has to be a particular size in order to survive for five years, ten years, and make sure that goods are actually being given to products. So yeah, that's um, generally the discussion discussion as to why price fixing is per se, but moving beyond that kind of violation, the economics and the business sense behind a lot of these seemingly bad actions warrants a second look. So about the supply chain, you mentioned that these are vertical agreements in the supply chain. Now, in the context of competition policy, I've heard these combinations of words before, supply chain, vertical, which is the case of mergers and acquisitions. Could you tell us more about mergers and acquisitions and what it would mean if they were horizontal mergers or vertical mergers. So horizontal and vertical refer to your position on the supply chain. If something is horizontal, if one company is horizontal to another, that means they exist in the same level. They're both sellers. They're both distributors. They're both producers. They're both, you know, on. there's both the same type of company. If you're vertical, that means you're on different levels of another. So a vertical agreement or a vertical arrangement would be between the maker of the good and the wholesale distributor of that good or between the wholesale sale distributor and the retailer of that good or between the maker of that good and the re and the retailer of that good. So when it comes to M&A, um, it's self-explanatory. It's, it's Horizontal mergers are between two companies in the same level of the supply chain. Vertical mergers are between companies um, that are on different levels of the supply chain. What are the justifications for those? Uh, horizontal mergers, um, generally they believe that there will be more cost synergies because instead of two companies trying to compete on very and very different ways of procuring the product or making the product they can just combine the production lines and become more efficient you know those kinds of justification if it's a vertical merger um that general reasoning is you know you instead of having these two disparate companies um trying to do economic activity uh, within the same industry you can just combine them again into one firm and then make sure and because they're now in one under one firm it is easier for them to coordinate the economic activity that they're doing so rather than having to always draw up a contract between a producer of a 
a good and the retail retail company of that good uh if you merge them then all those all those um activities are in house there's no more costs of drawing up these contracts there's no more cost of trying to communicate with them there's no more cost of having to uh, make sure they are fulfilling each other's quotas because they're all under one company so that's generally the consideration between horizontal and vertical so we pay quite an amount per year to have the podcast hosted on spotify so i guess a vertical merger would be something like being acquired by spotify or our hosting services but as for horizontal mergers the most well-known case of that happening recently is perhaps the merger between Grab and Uber. Could you tell us what happened there? Grab at the time, so Grab and Uber obviously were competing for Southeast Asia, right? And if, I'm not sure if the kids reached this, but you know there really was a time where you get a lot of these discounts or promotions, uh, depending on whether you you were using Grab or Uber at that specific time of the day. Um, but then in but then I think in 2017, uh, a deal was struck between Uber and Grab. So Uber would sell. Uh, it's what's was exiting from the Southeast Asian market and was basically selling its units there to Grab. So that was very problematic at the time because it was only again it was only Grab and Uber in you know the car in the you know in the in in the in, in the particular industry you know where uh, where the ride hailing the car ride hailing service uh, in, in industry in the Philippines. So from two competing companies, two companies that are competing very vigorously, just to emphasize, one of them was basically exiting the market and having their assets acquired by Grab. So from a te- technically a duopoly, it was becoming a monopoly. So uh, a lot of a lot of uh, market participants sounded the alarm, um, and obviously all across Asia, a lot of antitrust authorities were getting in on reg- on on investigating the merger because it was basically uh, Grab um, was paying to was paying Uber to exit the market and acquire them. Again, these are all just, uh, again, uh, just to emphasize, these are not the views of the BCC. I'm, again, speaking on my personal capacity and understanding of the matter. Uh, but at least in the Philippines case, we didn't even need it to be notified first. I, I believe it would have gone to formal notification anyway because of the thresholds. But the Philippine Competition Commission initiated a motu proprio uh, investigation against it, against it, meaning it of its own accord, um, precisely because there is precisely because uh, it could have had major harms to consumers. Um, and they did find that, you know, the, the, the merger between Grab and Uber was potentially going to lead to these harms. Uh, without the pressure of Uber, Grab was forecasted to be able to raise its prices. Um, obviously, that would be harmful to consumers, especially if there was still limited supply. Um, and they didn't expect any competition in that matter. Like, between a taxi and a Grab, taxi and a grab car, functionally, they might be the same, right? They're, they're both, they're both four-wheel vehicles and you both have to call them up. But there were still very significant differences that would have precluded um, taxi drivers or taxi companies from being able to threaten Grab with a bad time and lower their prices. Uh, and th- again, this goes back to what we mean by price. Price isn't just, you know, the lower, the, the, the actual cost of the item. It's qualities and services. And I'm sure most of us know that Grab and Uber had services and qualities that made it fundamentally different from your regular uh, taxi hailing service. With a taxi hailing service, and I've personally tried this in the past, you would have to your most uh, on demand that you could get even uh, most remotely on demand that you can get with the taxi is that maybe you had the phone number of the taxi company and you hope that they operate in their area but with grab and uber it's literally just an app and they will find a driver for you obviously um with taxi companies as well uh, i'm not sure about the regulation there but i'm sure the ability of grab and uber to monitor their partner drivers was significantly more advanced than your regular taxi hailing services um with regards to uncas and other motorbike hailing services i don't think those would have been developed those things did not develop as much until later on uh, and again i'm pretty sure there's a difference between riding a four-wheeled vehicle in comfort versus hanging on for dear life or on a motorcycle so given those considerations um the pcc found that the merger was going to be problematic and they imposed a lot of uh, voluntary commitments on grab i'm not entirely sure what those are but i'm not entirely sure about those details but i do know there were commitments to ensure that you know um, certain only um certain Certain prices had to be maintained for consumers, uh, a certain, especially during peak hours. They had to ensure that the Uber partner riders would be given a place in Grab or given a, uh, their choice as to whether they could stay in Grab or did not have to work for Grab anymore. All these things to protect the consumer at the end of the day. So that's what the PCC did with regards to Grab and Uber. So it's, it's, it's horizontal because obviously both of them are ride-hailing apps. They both provided four-wheeled vehicles for those ride-hailing apps. And there was just literally no other person on the market that was going to be able to 
sort of makes sense. We actually wanted to ask Venti about some other more recent competition issues we're facing in the Philippines, but we know and we just want our listeners to know too that Venti might not be able to talk about that legally. Right. Because Venti, you are covered under a non-disclosure agreement, right? So yes. let's talk instead about competition cases in other countries. And the most famous of these kinds of cases right now is a case going on, an ongoing legal battle between Epic Games, or as other people might know them, the creators of Fortnite, and Apple. You know, that Apple. <laughs> Regarding how Apple allegedly abuses its dominance using its App Store. Could you tell us more about that case? Right, so I'm not sure how many people are familiar with that here, but generally Apple, Epic Games sued Apple and Google for basically kicking them out of their of their sites at this one time. I believe Epic was developing its own payment channel so that instead of having to pay through Apple's the, the app stores of Google and Apple so you can get your Fortnite skins, um, I'm not going to judge, but I'm also not sure what the economic benefit of that is for most people. Um, you can pay directly through Epic. So the allegation of Google and Apple was that by developing that separate channel, um, Epic Games was now in violation of some contracts with regards to your presence in the app store. So they, you know, they, they, they chucked them out of the app store. So Epic Games sued Google and Apple for, you know, abuse of dominance. Like, say, they were, um, which seemed ser- fairly self-evident at the time um, because obviously Google was the only one who owned the Google uh, Play Store. Apple was the only one on the Apple Store. It seemed to make sense that they were using their positions as ver- as um, owners of, lo- of the most leading app stores globally to screw over uh, Epic Games and their burgeoning new, cha- burgeoning new payments channels. So this is where... Um, things get tricky because digital markets are very unique animal. And the way that the digital markets operate to oversimplify for this discussion is that it's not so much the product that people are that people and companies are developing, but more so the channels and the ecosystems that um, that are they're able to market. So when you look at Shopee and Lazada, I mean, obviously having a great um, payments channels and great offering is is, is 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 a good thing for shoppers and for the people trying to sell their goods online. But that's not really what the value of Shopee and Lazada are, and that's re- not really what the value of the app stores are going to be. It's the fact that you're connecting millions of people onto one common channel that so that they're able to harvest their data about it so that they're able to glean economic information about what these users want and you're able to design all these different platforms and applications around them so that's really what the digital market is about it's not so much creating an app because it's the best app for the best service it's about creating an app so that you can gather all these different users into one ecosystem and then you can develop all these different needs for them and profit from them so okay why why is the epic games an interesting case um because the legal and slash economic economic defense of Google and Apple, and I think this is going to probably win them the case, or at least make it very hard for Epic Games to win, is that um, there are a lot of costs into developing a digital ecosystem or a digital platform. Um, and this is, I, I think this will help in, your, in defending big tech. Big tech is not so much about, again, creating the best app. It's about creating the best ecosystem. So when you're really talking about innovation, especially in the early stages of a digital market or, or big tech, it's not so much about innovating the best service. It's about it's about making sure you're getting an acceptable service but you're able to get a lot of users to sign up for that service so that you can eventually train your models around them you can develop get the data on these people so that you can better tailor the services how does this apply to the google store and the apple store well very simply um google and apple took the risk of making a platform uh, which will host millions of users uh, and host millions of services and they've made secure payment channels they've made secure platforms for developers to play around and sell their products and they've made convenience stores where hundreds of thousands of products are available to millions of millions of users all around the world. So it only makes sense that Google and Apple should be able to profit from their innovation, profit from the risks that they took. And that is somewhat threatened when someone, when a developer who has um, been using those platforms is now suddenly threatening them by taking away their revenue by having a competing payments channels. In Epic Games' case, um, they were supposed, again, they were supposed to be violating their conditions as a developer on the stores by not making use and not abiding with the payment schemes that are necessary for apps to operate on that store uh, instead going through a developing going through a direct payment channel this might have made sense if Epic Games was not existent at all on Google Store and App Store unfortunately they were so they had to play around with those rules supposedly and those rules were set up in place so that Google and Apple would profit from their ecosystem so this is an example of where supposedly um, abuse of dominant position becomes tricky because on one hand the 
conduct is very clear. Like, you know, Google and Apple, they're the only ones with a very strong functional application stores. Only Google controls the Google Play Store. Only Apple controls the Apple Store. Uh, and they're making epic games to pay for that. But on the other hand, because of the unique economics of digital ecosystems, it would be a harm to the ecosystem for Google and Apple if you just let users and developers willy-nilly profit of staying there and then, you know, taking all the revenue and business away from them. So I hope that clarifies the discussion. It's a very interesting discussion. Uh, I think people should definitely read up more on those cases. Um, it will also apply to Amazon as well. Um, they, you can look up the ongoing EU investigations against Amazon, Google, and Apple. Um, yeah. There's also a case involving Amazon right now involving like digital markets. This, admittedly, I'm not very familiar with. So what was the case about? So I believe the EU is currently investigating Amazon. I don't know if it's for the end time. Um, because again, Amazon is the owner of the Amazon store. Um, and you know, a lot of people, a lot of stores uh, can sell their products there as independent retailers. And a lot of people get their goods from Amazon. Uh, but in recent years, Amazon developed its own uh, uh, in-house store within the Amazon website. So you have the Amazon website and you have all these different users who are the sellers and one of those sellers happens to be someone under Amazon you know it, it's, it's very easy. I think uh, one part of that is the Amazon basics where you can get basic household goods directly sourced from Amazon so the charge there and I think this is a bit more um, a, a bit a, a bit e uh, I wouldn't say easier to prosecute I think the conduct is probably more clear of a harm than what Google and Apple were doing to Epic Games uh, the charge is that Apple is unfairly using its dominant position as the host of the website and you know of the Amazon website in the store to harvest the data harvest non harvest non public data of all the other independent retailers using it so that they can use that data on customer sales and customer preferences to design the choices in the Amazon in-house store so uh to so like for example let's say all these different retailers are selling um, electron vid uh, video games and video games accessories uh, so obviously the data of those transactions how many people are buying at a certain fund uh, what particular products are they buying are they just buying the PS5 are they buying the PS5 and controller accessories at the same time how many customers are doing that at a certain time all that data um, is a lot of that data is, pri is supposed to be private to these independent retailers even if they're on the Amazon website maybe Amazon only has the metadata for payments channels and you know user interaction because that's what they need to monitor their web traffic but Amazon has access to the private data for some reason and it's now looking at these trends and saying oh okay if this is what independent retailers are servicing let's just use this data for ourselves and then you know make sure that our own Amazon store Amazon basics will be able to sell those products at far cheaper prices because these independent retailers are not Amazon they don't have the huge ass warehouses that Amazon has they don't have the cloud uh, cloud uh, computing services that Amazon has to be able to process all this web traffic and all this data so that's an abuse that's a potential abuse of domin dominance the European Union is investigating um, it's an abuse of dominance because again Amazon is the only owner of the Amazon store I'd imagine most people will think that it's different compared to say Facebook marketplace uh, or any other website I won't get too much into the details and they are using their unique position as the uh, owner of that website to get non-public data and use it to their own advantage lastly let's talk about a company that virtually everyone hates right Google you mentioned Google already in this episode so throughout, um, but people on the left don't like Google because of private data privacy concerns. Conservatives don't like Google either because it allegedly silences conservative ideology, stuff like that. But there were also several competition cases involving Google that you foreshadowed earlier in this episode. What was the deal with Google in these cases? The three major Google cases that the EU has prosecuted, they have their different nuances. I think people should do their own research too. But in general, Google is Google, right? Like you don't you don't ask people hey are you going to bing this or are you going to facebook searches no you ask them to google something um when you're searching for something so obviously google is a very dominant search engine and they're able to develop a lot of these ancillary services because of them um google marketplace um where there's an in app there's an in uh in, an in engine function to give product suggestions uh google ads where developers are able to where websites are able to pay for ad space on the google pages and basically google again used its data from the search engines 
uh, from search engine news uh, to analyze the trends of what people are searching and what stores are they're going to and what products they're looking at so that they could prioritize Google's own ancillary services there. So one was Google AdSense. Um, I'm not sure which, which Google company they were benefiting, but basically they were heavily prioritizing Google's own companies in the prioritization of Google's ad searches. For another one, for Google Marketplace, they were suggesting, they were prioritizing search suggestions for Google affiliated companies or products as opposed to other retailers whose ads or products were going to appear on Google Marketplace. So again, it's 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 a wonderfully developing case on the digi on digital markets because digital markets aren't so, again, so much about the products as so much as they are the users and the channels and the data that you're going to be able to harvest. And obviously, you want to reward companies for taking that risk. If you're able to build an app that millions of people will consistently use, you should be able to profit from that. The problem becomes when that ecosystem um, can extract a lot more value from the, those users and use it to enrich their own position, potentially at the cost of higher prices for these consumers and lower opportunities for competing business developers. So I think those are some very good cases that people should take the time to Google. <laughs> yeah, see, there, that people should take the time to search for online and read up on their, in their spare time. This has been a really long episode and I was very <laughs> happy with it as, as someone who is personally very interested in competition economics, um, as someone who has taken up competition policy in undergrad. But how about you? Um, I wanted to ask you how we could, you know, bring other people into the fold and be more invested in these kinds of topics. Like, is there any advice that you would give or any readings you would like to suggest for people who might not know enough right now, but they are considering, you know, dipping their toes into the water, so to speak, and learn more about this new field, this new field of law and, you know, economics that we found ourselves into. All right. So I'm guessing if you have access to your library in school, there's a really good book that um, I read when, you know, when we were taking this as undergrad under industrial organization. It's called The Antitrust Revolution. It's a compilation of cases by Quokka and White. Um, they're all American cases, but I think they're very informative. So uh, these are compilations of cases that were prosecuted in, um, in the United States for, you know, comp violations of competition law. So you have your price fixing, you have your barriers to entry, you have your predatory pricing, you have your uh, vertical price agreement. Uh, and they're very digestible because you're not reading the actual cases. You're reading summaries of the cases and then you're getting, and then the, the authors and the writers give the economic insights as to the prosecution of the defendant's cases. And then a quick summary as to what happened after the cases. So I think that's a very good book. Um, I read it, we read it as the class was going on because obviously that's how that's how introduction to industrial organization and competition economics work. I think it's very digestible. Um, it might take a bit of background in economics, but nothing of a little knowledge of supply and demand should be able to fix. I'm sure we all know that as debaters. Um, but I think it's a very digestible set of cases. Um, I would also recommend that you just go to the Philippine Competition Commission website. Um, I'm sure there's one or two primers uploaded there uh, as to why competition policy is important, especially as part of development. If you look up the Philippine Development Plan, I'm, I, I think there is there is an entire chapter devoted to national competition policy and how we want to use um, encourage free market competition for industries to grow, for consumers to develop, for consumers to get a better prices uh, and stuff. So there's there's really a lot of resources online just to just to just be able to search for these things and uh, learn and then learn from them on your own time. But I think the what you just really want to keep in mind is okay. Uh, I know that as a consumer, I want good stuff. I know that there are companies doing trying to make this stuff. Um, what would it mean for me? And what did it mean for these businesses if these companies started suddenly started dropping out and one company was able to control all the production, all the distribution? Um, and I think that's why competition policy is important because it's it, it, it is it's it's a very real world application of who controls the resources to produce these things. How can we best regulate them as a government? How can consumers be more aware of the the things that businesses are trying to do in their daily lives? Oh yeah, that's just my my thoughts about it. Yeah, so I guess that's it for this episode of Debatable. Again, thank you so much, Venti, for taking time out of your night. <laughs> um, and just to be clear, we're recording this very late at night for the listeners that we have. Um, this has been an insanely exciting episode for me, and we're going to be releasing this around the same time as my birthday. So I am extra excited about that. Um, even though we're you know recording this in June. I'm thinking that far ahead. Advance ako magisip. But anyway, thank you so much again, not just to Venti for taking their time out of their night to record with us, okay, but yeah. also to you, the listener, for taking time out of your day to listen to Venti and I and Nina talk about things that I am personally very invested in, even if you might not necessarily be invested in this topic. So, we'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye! Bye! -bye. Bye.